Well, it's the 6th of October. Welcome to the show. It's Keris here up until 12 o'clock. It's a very special show today, though. We are recording live from Maida Vale in the legendary studio. We've got the Bing Crosby plaque right behind an audience of 200. Say hello, everybody. <laughs> Are we all excited or what today? It's a very, very special day. There's an amazing box set coming out of Clash Classics and remastered hits selection from Mick Jones has remastered and we'll be talking to Mick about it later on. What else have I got in store for you? Johnny Green, their tour manager, is coming along so we can ask him lots of questions as well. The audience, you're going to be asking questions as well, aren't you, to The Clash and um, also we've got a performance poet as well called Longfellow to join us today. When I was invited to do this Clash special, the first thing I always ask any musician that comes to the studio is to give me a list of tracks. I think it takes you in surprising places and indeed some of the track choices were very surprising but this one is not so surprising and I wonder if you can guess whose choice this was. It's a classic. from 1956. The girl can't help it. We are here live in front of 200 people at the Maida Vale Studios and I thought I'd uh, come and say hello. Hello, are you, how are you today? All right, yeah. Where have you come from today? Um, Sunderland. And what is it about the Clash that you love? Just everything. I really just enjoy all the music. Like how they went from like punk roots, right through to doing everything, you know, like all different styles. Because the styles changed radically, didn't it, over the years? Do you have any favourite sort of periods? Probably about 78, 79. I'll go next door to you. What's your name, sir? Sam. And where have you come from today? Peterborough. And why are you such a big fan of The Clash? Well, because of my parents, really, and everything, just growing up listening to The Clash and stuff, yeah. Why are they set apart? I don't know, really, like, their style and everything, and just the songs are just brilliant, yeah. Do you have any favourite periods for them? Uh, well, I have a favourite song, Guns of Brixton. You might be playing that later, I think. Well, uh, did you guess whose choice that was? Any guesses? It was Paul Simonon's choice in his list, actually. He had quite a lot of rock and roll. He's um, included Huey Piano Smith, Larry Williams, among many, many other tracks as well. Have a listen to this one and then have another guess at whose list this was on. That's Jet Harris and Tony Meehan and a track called Diamonds, and that was a Mick Jones choice. I don't know if you guessed that one. Uh, if you just joined us, it's Karis here at Six Music, and we're doing a live special on The Clash from Maida Vale Studios. And I found this on YouTube very recently. Uh, he's a performance poet that was performance poet for Glastonbury Festival. Yeah. And you've been on the show before. Oh, Welcome. Okay. You hear the, the voice of Longfellow, you're known as, also known as Tony Walsh. Tell me... Tony, why did you write a poem about the clash in 2013? I was a, a council house kid in, in Manchester in, in 78, 79 by the time punk, you know, hit the airwaves and hit the council estates. And it was, it was, I'm sure a lot of people in the room today will agree, it was just electrifying for kids like us, the message and the sound and just so exciting. And, and my book's called Sex and Love and Rock and Roll and, and I want to write about exciting things. Um, so I've written a Shakespearean sonnet about the clash. <laughs> It asks, in these days of Simon Cowell and X Factor, where the next rebel band's coming from. It's called The Last Gang in Town? Question mark. Who these days are the rebels worth the name? Who hates the army, hates the RAF? Who these days takes a gutter sniper's aim? Who fights the law with every beaten breath? Who these days has the baselines or the balls? Who sussed and struts where white man fears to tread? Who these days answers back when London calls? Who catches fire and burns like Natty Dread? Who'll wave a flag above the ship parade? Who'll educate and agitate the youth? Who'll use guitars as weapons unafraid to rock the very casbah with the truth? Come stand and fight together, not alone. Go start yourself a riot of your own. Set the scene, if you can. You said you grew up in the late 70s. Just to show how fresh that sort of questioning of the politics and the finding of a voice was. They're showing the old Top of the Pops on television from 76, 78, 79. There's novelty songs and it's prog rock. And the bands were, you know, it was either straight from Pontins or they're in the 40s and 50s. And so these bands were just a few years older than us. They came from our background, they talked to us, and it was just an electric shop, a junk lead to the spine. You know, and, and to hear political music, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, part of our political awakening was the clash and the bands that followed them, like the specials, like the jam, like Stiff Little Fingers. It just electrified the scene and, and, and changed a lot of people's lives. Tony, thank you very much. Big round of applause for Longfellow. 
The Sound of Cinema on BBC Radio 6 Music. From 1967, the Guns of Navarone and the Scartelites. I uh, enjoyed that in the studio, didn't we? We are here live in front of uh, 200 people at the Maida Vale Studios, and I thought I'd uh, come and say hello again to somebody else. How are you? Hello, how are you? Where have you come from today? Uh, I come from Kent. And uh, how long have you been a Clash fan? Uh, since time immemorial. So a long time since they were around, you know. And uh, you went to see them a lot live? I've seen them, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I grew up in the West Country, so they were the band that made me come to London, pick up a set of drumsticks, so they mean a lot, you know, mean a lot. Could you describe what their kind of live set was like? Aggressive, um, eclectic, different, sometimes controlled, sometimes not. What do you mean by that? Totally exciting and really there, out there, it was spot on, do you know what I mean? You could ever not love The Clash, you know? What's your name? Graham. Thanks, Graham. That was uh, Mick Jones' choice, if you were wondering. Uh, the Clash are well known for their love of ska and reggae, but we'll be talking to them later about their love of soul music as well. Um, there were some surprising track suggestions, including Willie Nelson, Procol Harum, and uh, there was a Laverne Baker one as well, a track called Dicks of Billy. But I'm going to play you this one. Ash, and before that you heard Laverne Baker and Jimmy Rex and a track called You're the Boss from 1961. You're listening to Six Music and it's Karis here up until midday and you're listening to a very special show today. We are doing a live special in front of an audience. Say hello! hello. And uh, we're in the legendary Maid of Ale studios in the Bing Crosby. I call it the Bing Crosby studio in Studio 3. We are going through some of the song selections from the band. We haven't heard from Topper yet, so I don't know if you've uh, picked up on that. So I thought we'd uh, do a Topper choice next. But in fact, Mick Jones chose a track from this artist as well. And I'd love to ask them about it later, about their experimenting and pushing the boundaries of music. So hopefully that, uh, we can ask that question. Uh, it is Captain Beefheart, and it's a track that shows Topper's love for the blues to Gimme That Harp. That was Captain Beefheart and Gimme That Harp Boy, sounding remarkably like Spoonful by Willie Dixon, a brilliant choice from Topper Heedon. I'm Keris Matthews and you're listening to a special show we recorded down at the BBC's Made of Ale Studios with a clash in front of a live studio audience. We'll be talking with a Clash tour manager, Johnny Green, about his time with the band in the next half hour before I bring in the three remaining members. So stay tuned after the news. Epic sounds there from the Tornadoes and Telstar. And that is a Mick Jones choice. That track came out in 1962. Welcome to the show, Johnny Green. Thank you. I'd love to ask you about the beginning, the very beginning, because you, you ended up being a tour manager for The Clash and also John Cooper Clark now. But where did it begin? How did you get into that kind of... I was the fan that got lucky, Keris. You know, any of you could have been where I am. You know, what, was I technically equipped to do the job magnificently no i had no electrics but i'm fond of a roller gaffer tape it has to be said <laughs> was i a professional driver no never done any of that in my life i think what happened no nobody ever bothered to tell me typically with the clash i obviously fitted the bill had the right attitude like the same music that they did and was willing was it important to them that the people they hung out with had great music taste like mm. they listened to music all the time they got cassettes going they had the yeah. beatbox going when those uh, beatboxes came in yeah it was a cacophony of different noises coming out of each person's one and driving in the car you know was just a car sometimes it was just one of those little tiny renos and they would fight that lot who you'll meet would fight to see who could control the music in the car like kids exactly like kids who would win Whoever Usually. was on form that day. And, of course, it does help, doesn't it, if you're in the passenger seat. <laughs> so let's, let's say Mick, shall we? <laughs> but Paul is a very persuasive man. Very persuasive. I'm very curious, as, as a member of a band myself, and, and knowing how touring works, that I, I've heard that with The Clash, you know, it's all about equality, there's an open door policy. You're on tour, so everybody's allowed to come backstage in the dressing room. Everyone's allowed on the tour buses. That must have been absolute chaos. Yes, yeah, fabulous. <laughs> I loved it. That was one of the things that really attracted me to The Clash, you know, that they thrived on chaos and trouble, you know. You might even say at times they encouraged it, but certainly one of the first things that I was asked to do was always make sure that backstage door was kept open for people who couldn't afford to get into the gig, you know? The waifs and strays, the gutter snipes, you know? And I was very pleased to do that. I didn't see those people as getting under my feet at all. I thought that was delightful. And equally, there were many, many nights where the crew have packed up 
loaded a truck, gone back to the hotel, taken down huge light-in rigs, you know, and the band are still sitting in the dressing room, sharing beers, chatting with their fans, until the last fan has got what they wanted. I thought that was wonderful to be applauded, you know. Did that ever change over the years? As no, they it never got more changed, more all the time. And taking that kind of attitude to America was so strange because the American audiences couldn't understand that. They really, really wanted The Clash to be superstars and remote people from their daily lives. And the band were not having that at all. Was there at any point where one of the members of the band or the crew said, look, that's enough, it's enough? Hired members of the crew would just say, this is ridiculous. These people (laughs) are in the way. They're harming efficiency. Uh, (laughs) You know, these were trainee health and safety people, you know? (laughs) And uh, the reply to that would be, yes, but they're enhancing the ambience of the event. Very important. Were you in the studio with them? Yeah. How was the setup in the studio? Well, originally... Was there a typical setup, or did it always just vary? No, there was. They knew how they wanted it, and they wouldn't be pushed around, you know? They were learning on the job, really, each of them in their own ways, how to uh, construct and communicate songs, how to put them together, and how to record them, how to sound at their best without going sterile. I think that was always one of the problems, you know, that, that they feared. So they were always together in the studio, apart from, you know, the odd drop-in, the odd dub. It, it was always a collective uh, approach to recording. Interestingly mm. enough, they picked uh, the faces. Because mm. you think about bands, and, and some bands haven't got that team mentality that mm. you can just sense it with a clash, mm. and you sense it with the faces, that they were all in it together. How important were the four members of that band and their roles within it? Well, I think it was crucial, you know. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche to say it's all in the chemistry, isn't it? But it certainly was that. I detected remarkably four people and more, which I'll come back to, Keris, Four people who pulled to the middle, not pulling away from the unit that was the band. They pitched in, considering each other. Obviously, that wasn't to last. But then I don't think it should anyway. I think a band is like a Roman candle. It burns brightly and then goes out. That's fantastic. Job done. No one intends it to be that way, but it doesn't really matter. And so for those times when they were recording and sharing ideas... They were all the time thinking of each other and pulling to the centre. They were a unit. And more than that, I was privileged enough to often be consulted. You know, they they would say, what do you think? What do you think about this? You know, we've got this idea. What do you reckon? And I thought that was very generous of them, really. I was never treated as a hired hand, you know. I was always treated with intelligence. Let's hear some music. See if you can guess who chose this track. Okay. That was the message by Grandmaster Flash. I'm here with Johnny Green, who was tour manager in the Clash during those sort of like 77 to 80 years. Yeah. Johnny, who do you reckon shows that one? Without a doubt, that's the topper. He overpowers me with his funk. <laughs> <laughs> he was unstoppable with that stuff. And, and him and his sidekick, who was my mate, a bloke called The Baker, just The Baker, who travelled around in his little car around London in the endless weeks of rehearsal that we did. That's what he'd play. And Topper was a real joy in rehearsals because I would be in there making sure everything was ready so they could walk in and start rehearsing every day. And it was every day. And uh, Topper was always the first one in. And he would bounce in on the balls of his feet. Everything would be set up, drums, bass, two guitars. And he could play them all. And he would play them all before they came in with great gusto and in the enthusiasm of a schoolboy, really. Do you think he's pivotal in pulling the clash and setting them so far apart from the contemporaries? Well, all I can say is that whatever new numbers were introduced, he played around with them and fed them back to the songwriters and said, what do you think about this, or have you thought about it this way? He never just kept a beat because he was told to. Maybe that's his great worth. Yeah. We were talking about experimenting and being Mm. in the studio. Was there ever a point where somebody was just pushed it too far, and if that did happen, who was pulling him back? Words would be said, because that's frank and that's honest. Mm. So if things weren't appreciated or talents weren't fully recognised, then words would be said, yeah. Let's talk about Joe Strummer. Okay. He was known at one point in his life as Woody Mellor, Mm. a huge fan of Woody Guthrie. Mm. So let's talk about his sort of folk troubadour side and Mm. also his very magpie nature in the way he wrote his lyrics. Yeah. Well, Woody, you should know this, Keris, you know, because he picked that stuff up down in South Wales where it was called Woody. So we love to go and play Cardiff Top Rank where others of the band would pick the telephone up. I can't do it very good. Stay with me. uh. (laughs) And they go, hello, is that Woody? Woody, are you there? And when he found out it was Simo or Topper or someone, he'd be very cross because, you know, 
he'd started again, especially in early days. He'd put that behind him, really. As it would turn out, he hadn't, had he? He'd merely stored it for future reference. But in early punk, yeah, no, that was gone, really, for a while. But he never lost his interest in people and the interest in putting what he thought was mm. social issues into the songs. Mm. And yet he seemed so busy talking with people all the time. Mm. How did he have the time to clock the ideas, mm. store the ideas, and put the ideas in song? Well, I think he was always busy, really. He, he didn't take time out. He never did take time out if there was a slack period in the studio you'd find him in his little bunker made that we would build him of, of flight cases or indeed just underneath a piano you know hiding away there lying on his stomach you know the famous penny smith picture where he's lying there looking like a kid with a coloring book but he's writing lyrics i mean the other thing was we would we'd hit a town and joe was the one who was always very very keen to go for a walk I would frequently accompany him and we'd go off, we'd go in a calf or in a boozer and he'd want to know and talk to people there about what it is to live in Dunfermline, you know, or Manchester or Sheffield. He would talk to them about their lives, their conditions, the topography, really. Let's play some more music. You're going to hang out now, aren't you? I am. Please do. I am. Um, and uh, I'll play this and I'm not going to be okay. uh, empty. That was The Temptations with I Wish It Would Rain, a Mick Jones choice, and before that, Marvin Gaye's iconic What's Going On, as selected by Topper Heden. I'm Keris Matthews, and you're listening to a special show we recorded down at the BBC's legendary Maida Vale studios with The Clash in front of a live studio audience. Johnny Green, who tour managed The Clash from 1977 to 1980, is my guest at the moment. Tell me, Johnny, about the band's love for soul music. Everybody likes soul music. I even blagged a ticket, go and see Smokey Robinson at the London Palladium during that time, dressed up, you know, smart to go and see, fabulous. Went to see Marvin Gaye as they did. We were always out in the town. One of the nice things about being a happening band early on, you're getting free anywhere. Did they keep the combat gear on and just swap to have like, oh, oh that, that was the punk gear, let's put the soul stuff well, on. Well, you know, just when you thought you got a handle on the Clash's appearance, they changed, didn't they? I always remember the time we're out at the Monterey Pop Festival, you know, and there are all these hippies, and then there are a bunch of kind of punk rockers, California. Ha <laughs> ha, we're punk rockers, look at us, we're cool, you know? And in fact, they changed again because uh, it's the second American tour and they'd gone for Johnson suits, hats and quiffs, you know, we <laughs> Greece. And so the punk rockers looked like the dinosaurs suddenly. It was kind of, hey, this is moving fast, you know. Did they ever go and shop in Elvis's favourite shop in Memphis? Well, Lansky Brothers. Yes. A fabulous shop. Yes. Sadly, we didn't play Memphis, Keris. I've got a wonderful, wonderful track to play next. John Holtz in the band. It is the Paragons. Are you a fan? I think John Holt has the most wonderful voice. Paragon's there and riding on a high and windy day. We've got a surprise now. Johnny's just uh, brought up some documents. What have we got? Well, you know, I knock around with a lot of literature these days. I, I knock around the world with John Cooper Clark, ace poet. But here's another one, look. This one came to me through the uh, electronic doodah from the poet Porky the Pig. And I don't know... If you know who Porky the Pig is, he started out as an unknown. It's Phil Jupiter's. You might know him better. I see him off the telly. A clever man. I rang him and he was out. And uh, he wrote this poem. It's called Johnny Green Miss Call 934. Yesterday. The name Johnny Green flashed up on my screen. A telephone call I had missed. I keep it on silent, which drives some folks violent. They think I am taking the piss. It makes mates irate that I eschew vibrate. They find it both rude and unpleasant. But I think it most odd when someone other than God is expected to be omnipresent. So I returned Johnny's call by the coffee shop wall, the pleasantries duly exchanged. Then he passed on some news which gave me the blues. From good humour I became quite estranged. Would I, as a friend, be keen to attend a BBC studio do? Friday afternoon, in a dimly lit room, Johnny chatting with friends who I knew. I asked who they'd be in Studio 3 at the complex down by Maida Vale when Johnny replied that this boy could have cried like my flat white I became cold and pale. We'll be having a chat, just chewing the fat about albums and tours reminiscing. We've saved you a chair. You have to be there. It won't be the same with you missing. I took him to task. What mates? I did ask. The tension between our two phones? The chaps, Johnny said. I felt almost dead. Paul Simonon. Topper Heden, Mick Jones, and one empty chair for the man who's not there, our beloved and lost absent friend. 
So it's sad you can't come, my dear Essex chum. I'll pass your best wishes to them. So I stand here forlorn, a man Isle of Wight born. What I say now is not being rash. Thank you all, my dear friends, as my set now ends, to be here of Miss T with a clash. Johnny Green and Phil Jupiter's poem there. It's time for us now to invite Mick Jones and Paul Simonon on top of Heaton Inn, ladies and gentlemen, The Clash. BBC Radio 6 Music. I was just saying to the band, that's a money spinner if you're a busker. It mm. was the one that brought the coins rolling in when we used to play it on the streets. It's a bit hard to do the drum intro when you're busking, though. <laughs> <laughs> you had to stamp on it with your tap shoes on the pavement, Welcome, everyone, to the studio, anyway. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. You were keen on giving um, a director's commentary to that yeah, song, no, but I, I want to ask have... you specifically about the very end. So I'm going to oh, clip yes. the very end, because I hadn't noticed you know it why? before. You know why? This is one of the great things about remasters is now we can hear the urinal at the end really is that clearly. what it was can yes. we have a little listen is that that's what it was i've been working for all these years that was recorded in the toilets at west right. it's very joe meek so, <laughs> can we have it a little bit lower on the third urinal along please can you is, are you serious yeah Smith? that was recorded in no, the toilets at west yeah, right, right, let's, 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 we, I've, I've clipped it because i was going to ask you what it was yeah. so there you go So set the scene. What the heck were you doing in the urinal recording? Getting an echo on the percussion. Echo. Echo is everything. Playing the pipes with a, a monkey wrench for that beat on the end. And then the toilet flush, so... You know, the on. amount of times that we used <laughs> yeah, the toilet. Unfortunately, somebody had to use the toilet at the same time. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> it was Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> well, some studios used to have their own echo chambers, right? And, but then if it was a cheaper studio, it didn't have it. And we'd just go like, well, stick a mic in the bog. <laughs> and, you know, let's see what happens. <laughs> because yeah, the but... rich, big studios like Rockfield, they have plate rooms, so that the brass yeah, plate was... for the reverb, so they have but massive rooms for But them. we're more of the Joe Meek school, really. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, he used to have people standing in the lavatory stomping up and down just to get an effect. Before yes. Echo Rooms, it was the place to do hand claps. It was the first. In the toilets for Echo. Yeah. You like Echo. I love Echo. And I love, I've always, my, one of my uh, ambitions was to build my own Echo Chamber <laughs> at home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have you uh, succeeded? And I've got a panic room now, and I'm thinking of putting a, <laughs> a why, mic why? at the bottom of it. Why Echo? Uh, you know, Phil Spector, really. Let's uh, talk about producers then. Uh, Guy Stevens, for instance. Yeah, he yeah. is a Phil Spector too. <laughs> yeah. That was one of his quotes. There are two Phil Spectres in this world, and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mick, what were you just going to say? I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> echo, <laughs> echo. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another clip for you. It is the most iconic intro to a song, and I would love for you to just say how it came about. You know, who decided to put what there? Why is there fuzz on the bass? Why this, that, and the other? Why have you used the top of the neck of the guitar? Here it is. The reason that Mick's guitar is there first is because he arrived first. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. It's One really interesting aspect of Should I Stay or Should I Go was the uh, Spanish translation in the third verse, sung by Joe Ely and uh, Joe, and it was in answer to um, what I was singing in the third verse, but um, we didn't know um, how to translate it, and... Uh, it just so happened that um, we had an engineer who was originally from Ecuador, or of Ecuadorian descent, in the studio in New York when we were originally recording the track. And uh, he said, well, I'll just phone my mum. And uh, he phoned his mum up. And so it's Ecuadorian Spanish. And it's just the answer to it. But I thought that was a like, really lovely moment, you know what I mean? Also, when it comes in at the start, you hear like, somebody go, Allah! And that's Joe Ely as well, and that just came out of nowhere. Alva. I think Halva. <laughs> Not Allah. No. no. Allah, Allah, just hit straight. Um, Nor Abba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're sticking with the production. I'm fascinated now, especially after listening to this on 11. The percussion. So, Topper, is that your department, the percussion in yes, the studio? Yes, it was my department, all the percussion, yeah. So, Except for military glockenspiel, which I <laughs> specialised <laughs> in <laughs> as a sideline. That was one of the great things about the band. I had the freedom to play loads of percussion. You know, on London Calling, 
they all just gave me free reign to do what I wanted on percussion. So with the remastering, you can hear it a lot clearer. So it's I'm I'm very happy. Keris, you used to ask for like load of percussion instruments from uh, my colleague, his uh, man, uh, the, the baker, baker yeah. and this great big cardboard box. Toy box. It from was a toy box. Yeah, it? that's exactly years. right. From yeah. Hamleys. It would come up from John Enrich's in uh, Golden Square. But mixed right, it was like a uh, kid at Christmas. Yeah, it used to be like a, like Dozens a big toy of bits. hamper. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd go into the box and I'd think, wow, what's that? I haven't played one of those before. And then, and then mess around on and it. And then by San Denisa, we were getting these specialists... Um, Jodie Watley was a very yeah. famous percussionist and she brought in rain stick. Like a, <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like a mixture between a didgeridoo and an hourglass. After it emptied this way, you turn it turn round it and yeah. that was all we had to do. But it was the way you kind of, you waved it, controlled how many beads fell. <laughs> and so it was like... <laughs> did you try the boom whacker, the plastic tube? That's we did in, that. Yes. We did that. Uh, one wonderful thing is uh, on Shepherd's Delight in uh, San mm. Easter. Um, yeah. It was about three. <laughs> it was that very thing, but it wasn't topper. It was like uh, Lowell Cream from um, 10cc. He was like, it was about three o'clock in the morning in Manchester in the studio, and we were all feeling pretty tired and emotional. And uh, we broke out the sheep noises. <laughs> <laughs> Lowell came to jam with us and so we said here yeah, have this shoot noise <laughs> and he's standing there if you listen to the record it's like dun 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 did it did it ever go yeah. too far his, no, yeah it did go it's too far it's an album called Sandinista <laughs> <laughs> was it you trying to rein it in Paul well unfortunately I wasn't well or maybe fortunately I wasn't there in the beginning of it I was way off duty elsewhere so, he was uh, doing a film in yeah. Vancouver wasn't it or did what? you just run away so when you just there was an excuse <laughs> so, i was actually at home so you got back to the studio and listened back to how the sessions were going and the thing is it that particular record album records was um over quite a long period of mm. time so uh, some was recorded in jamaica some in london some in new york so various places it really. was pretty much a free-for-all uh like long running like months of a uh, free-form jamming yeah that's what i like to call it it's like our free-form album we just Shine. made it up as we went along was that one of the most enjoyable periods in the studio they were all enjoyable every album was different they were all enjoyable for different reasons it was certainly one you of know, the longest <laughs> london calling was enjoyable because it was all written rehearsed and re you know what I mean it was all prepared for us and then we had obviously we had Guy Stevens as well and that was like an unforgettable experience and then Sandinista was different because we had lots of other musicians coming in and we were jamming and making it up as we went along we're talking about your love for Billy Cobham yeah did you listen to him from an early age I mean how did you get into that I listened to him he was like an incredibly powerful black drummer and he, he wasn't when I joined the band I remember saying they said what are your influences and I said Billy Cobham and they went no 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 really no <laughs> immediate no we no don't like Billy was, Cobham all that's going to have to go. But didn't you meet him? <laughs> yeah, later yeah. On? I met him in an airport in Germany, you know, with Jack Bruce. And when, when we were on the road so much, we were, you were always meeting other musicians at airports. Yeah. And I met him, you know, and he's like one of those people who's a hero. And he's still playing today. He's got to be in his 70s now. Yeah, I, he was playing London just yeah. recently. Let's hear some music. We're going to hear some beautiful percussion, Guns of Brixton. That was a Paul Simon on Choice TV Slim's Flatfoot Sam. I'm Karis Matthews and you're listening to a special show recorded with Mick Jones, Paul Simon on, on top of Heden of The Clash, alongside their tour manager Johnny Green, down at the BBC's Maida Vale Studios last month. We're currently discussing whether The Clash ever came to the Maida Vale Studios to record a session back in the day. As we were walking in, I said, haven't we been here before? And, yeah. and Mick and Paul said, yeah. We came in, we spent the whole day recording for John Peel or something. Yeah, till about it, one o'clock in the morning. Work, it didn't work, so we just walked out and left it. Didn't sound any good. It wasn't any good. Why? Well, it, it just, just didn't work. It was us, I'm sure. No, it's the, no speak for yourself, mate. Are those lost it, tapes now, then? It was the BBC engineers. But they usually do a great job. What was the matter? <laughs> well, I maybe they didn't get equipment. on with us and we didn't get on with them. Cause they didn't understand our sound and we didn't understand their sound. John Peel never forgave us. Yeah. Right. He was a big, you know, liked all good new music, <laughs> except for The Clash. <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember that, and wheeling all the gear out, and you walking out, and I, I was thinking at the time, many a band might have just said, oh, that'll do, that'll be fine, yeah, who cares, anyway. You didn't do that. Four yeah, we wouldn't huddled music. together, said, no, no, if it ain't good enough, it ain't going out, I'm, I'm walking out, out <laughs> onto that street out here, I remember it well. 
and sneaking out with your cases thinking, oh dear. <laughs> when did you decide on being so absolute with your music? Can you remember a moment when you just realised you, all four of you had the same attitude and the same ambitions for the music? I think that was an initiation that came in on meeting each other in the beginning. To put it this way, it was like me and Mick that started up together and via Bernie Road, who is a very important aspect to this conversation. We all discussed about getting Joe Strummer to be the singer, so me and Mick saw Joe playing in the 101 and thought he was pretty good, but his band wasn't so good, but he was great. So basically, Bernie Rhodes decided to uh, make a play to uh, get him to leave his band, which he did. And then Chopper came along. So it's a, a gradual process, really. And it didn't really take as long to sort of fall in, in so far as the early structure was quite tightly formed from the beginning. I think the attitude was there before the music. You know, it was the, the attitude of the band was, <clears throat> we're doing it our way, and we're keeping everything as much as we can in-house, and we're not going to try and rely on other people. And, and I think when the music happened as well it, it, we just adopted the same attitude for the music it's incredible that you, you were in the driving seats production side of and the sounds side of your music right from every, the get-go. every aspect from visuals down to sound down to what you heard uh, it was um, complete did you know this was it the four of you this is it well you didn't think this is it we just got on with it there was uh, an agenda to be adhered to which is to make records look great and do great shows and travel the world and spread the word of London and what's happening for us. You had an extraordinary ethic, which was an open door kind of policy. Your fans were everything to you. They could get anywhere. Yeah, that's on the true. Road. But a, a lot of that really comes from Mick because Mick's experience when he was a young man, he used to go to see uh, bands like Mott the Hoople in particular. But that's for Mick to say, really. So we sort of learnt a lot from Mick, really. Did it ever get too much, though? I'm just quite fascinated. Yeah, it did get too much. Yeah. It got way too much at times. Especially, I remember seeing Strummer drowning in conversation with people that wanted to have this big discussion about political situation in Nicaragua. And it's like, you know, he's just come off stage. <laughs> Whereas if I sat in the corner and scowled, then nobody would come near me. <laughs> and yet you kept those doors open all the yeah, way Yeah, the doors were open, yeah. you know. It was our way of getting to know what was happening in this town, wherever we were in the world. It was sharing information. Yeah, it was a two-way thing. You know, they came to see us and we got to see the kids in that town and what, what was going on. When you started out, it seems to me that you were going to go into the temple to pull down the temples, you know. One of the um, quotes from a song, no Elvis, no Beatles, no Rolling Stones. But you became those icons that you were trying to pull down. Yeah, wow. no, you got oh. to understand, at that time, that period, it was necessary to make these statements because it was like wiping the slate clean. We admired the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and Elvis and all that. Well, not so much Elvis for me personally. <laughs> but but we, you sense. know, we admired them, but it was about starting fresh. And we'd all grown up with this musical information from our own personal interests in our particular genres of music. But it was crucial at that period to clean the, the slate and say, this is where we're starting, this is what we're about. What you're saying about no Elvis Beatles or Rolling Stones, people have the same misconception about I'm so bored with the USA. It's not to be taken so literally, because I think music goes both ways. We take a lot from the past of the people who Poetic licence. And then we play. go forward with mm. something we've added to it. You know, but also it both, needed to be said ways. at the time, didn't it? Yeah, was, everything yeah. was bombastic, overblown. You had these posturing rock stars. And, it's and a great line as well. No Elvis Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Yeah. And yet, though, your collective knowledge was consummate, wasn't it? All four of you had a huge Definitely knowledge about studied every, various every aspects. Band that had come before. And I think we take all that with us and we bring it out. That's in there, you know what I mean? All the people that come before that influence us is actually in it as well. Gonna take a Nick Cone. That was Nick Cone, Nick Joe Cone. Strummer and the Mescaleros. The sound of his voice is some world weariness to his voice. So are you familiar with the song, Paul? Very much so. And actually, the gravity in his voice actually reminds me of people like Johnny Cash which I think Johnny Cash was a big influence. And I know that Joe met Johnny Cash. There's a great photograph of them two together. And uh, I was sort of not being there, but just seeing the photograph, it sort of warmed me up inside to know that he met 
character that he really <clears throat> admired. Yeah, we were doing an interview the other day and for, for an American radio thing, and we heard Joe's voice over our headphones. They kept putting and I thought on. even his speaking voice was so rich and deep. You know, he had an, an amazing speaking voice. You know, he has this honesty in his voice. You want to believe everything Sincerity, he says, and he pours yeah. everything into it. And then the hoarseness. There's a there's a few tracks that you recorded over the years. The hoarseness in his voice is just like. Yeah, so he used to have a lot of trouble on the road with his voice. Mm. He used to and he used consume to, a lot have, of lockets. He'd, he'd have a lot of he'd, all day long. He'd be having honey and lemon, and hot lemon, and joints. <laughs> <laughs> How was it to write with him, Mick? We went the whole gamut from great to not great. <laughs> it was great sometimes, and then later on it got... We came from, you know, hang on a minute, we need another song. Pop upstairs and write one in ten minutes. Me sitting on one side of the table, him sitting at a typewriter and banging it out and passing it across and knocking it out to, I'll post you the lyrics through the letterbox <laughs> and uh, hope you're not in. <laughs> <laughs> How was your thinking at that point when it had gone to that? It's a funny thing because um, Joe gave us this song and uh, it was called Trans Cash Free Pay One. It was a long time ago and uh, I did the music to it and it was the music which turned out later to be bottom line and uh, he didn't like it at all you know so I dumped those lyrics his lyrics then I did the bottom line did he get hurt when you rejected lyrics and did you get hurt when he I rejected was hurt. music I was, I was the injured party <laughs> yes <laughs> well later on we did write some more songs together and he was going to do them with the, the mescaleros and we wrote a batch because we didn't used to write one we used to write a batch at a time you know it's like a combo the idea was he's going to go in the studio with the mescaleros during the day and then send them all home, and I'd come in at night, and we work all night. He's in night. studio time. Yeah, <laughs> I'd come in at night, because I don't know what he wanted, but he, I don't think he wanted me to... you'd be awake. Mate. He said I would be awake, one, <laughs> and two, that I didn't want me to scare the others. And so he was going to do the record uh, overnight while he was making the record, the other record. So anyway, that didn't come to nothing, because obviously that wasn't going to work. You know, we knew that, but it was a nice idea. And then in, later on, a few months later... We were at some opening or something, and I said, oh, what happened to the songs? You know what I mean? Because we used to go like... Because if you didn't do them straight away and get them back straight away, it was like, what's wrong with them? Yeah. And so I went, what happened to the songs? And he went, oh, man, uh, they're the next Clash album. You're listening to me, Karis Matthews, with the remaining members of The Clash, recorded live in front of a studio audience last month around the release of Sound System, the career-defining box set. After the news, we'll be opening up the floor to members of the audience, so stay tuned. I'm Karis Matthews, and I'm joined by Mick Jones, Paul Simonon, and Topper Heaton of the band, as well as their unique tour manager, Johnny Green. This interview was recorded in front of a studio audience, and we will open up the floor to them in a second. But first, when you were listening back, putting this box set together, did you admire what you've recorded over the years? And did you admire Joe's lyrics and his input in it? For me... It brings back a lot of great memories and listening to the, the remastered, everything we recorded, I think I'm so proud of it, you know. And for me as well, the path my life took afterwards wasn't exactly great. And this is like wonderful to be back with Mick and Paul and it's just a really nice feeling, you know, something I thought I'd kiss goodbye to when I, you know, started my descent. <laughs> Did it bring a lot of memories back? Great memories, yeah. What people have to realise, it was great fun being in the clash. Yeah, we were a bit concerned. We thought we was going to turn up here and we were going to be sitting on bean bags. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, I also, I do think overall it's Joe's words that has carried us here, you know, more than anything, you know, it's the truth in those words that carries on, you know, so I'm just really happy to provide the vehicle for them to carry on. Yeah, you say that, but I've got one picture on my wall in my house and I rarely play your music, but when it pops up and I hear it, I am filled with it still in a way, I'm not by a lot of retro music. And uh, I don't think it's just the words, wonderful as they are. I always saw you as teamwork magnifico. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny, Johnny Green, Thank you, Johnny. I think a round of applause now for that. Well yeah. It is that team mentality and each one of you brought something so yeah, very special. True. Which we didn't appreciate at the time. We didn't think about, oh, this is, you didn't know, it, it's fun, it was enjoyable, we loved being in a band together. We were great mates. 
which was one of the biggest things as well. What I wanted was like, you know, four council flats next to each other, and then we'd all go in each of the individual doors, and then it'd be all one room <laughs> as we went in the council flat. Like the Beatles in uh, Help. Is that what you mean, Mick? Yes, uh, of course. I'm going to go to Don. Don, you've got a question for Mick, I do believe. When we were at uh, Strand Grammar School together, we had very boring um, music lessons, and so I was very surprised that you were such a great guitarist. Are you self-taught, or did you have lessons? I didn't have any lessons. No, I was pretty much self-taught. What happened was I'm... Um, do you remember Mr Chapman? He was the music teacher. And um, I used to just watch anybody who's doing music, be it whatever instrument or so, and say, how do you do that? How do you do that? And I was, like, really curious. And um, later on, when I got really ill in 1988, later on I got, like, chicken pots pneumonia and nearly died. And I had to go to, like, speech therapy and uh, learn to sing again. And one of the... Um, people I was led to was this big Australian opera singer woman and I had to go to Leytonstone and she taught me to sing again and then she went oh well, my husband's really interested to see you and then he came in it was Mr Chapman <laughs> the music teacher all those years later so you self-taught yourself in the bedroom in the uh, yeah pretty much in the bedroom I had like a year going auditions as a rhythm guitarist out of Melody Maker it wasn't much call for it it was pretty limited and so uh, I went I've got to do something more here I was searching for something more and so I went back to my uh, where I was living with my gran in the bedroom of the council flat and I just spent about a year again just playing along with people's records that I like, especially the Stones and that. And then Did I your nan like yeah, it? Yeah, she was, she was She's very supportive, lovely. isn't she? Yeah, very supportive. Mix now know, was great. Tea we all and mix now. Every, tea and sympathy. What music did she like? <laughs> uh, she liked uh, if Rap. you were the only girl <laughs> in the world. How about you, Topper? What's your musical background when you were growing up? Well, my mum and dad were Welsh, so all through my childhood I heard singing non-stop, as you would probably know, and it was all, like, church music and, you know, hymns and stuff. So there was a lot of musicality. My dad played piano, mum played piano. So it was, I was always surrounded by music, you know, and then obviously the Beatles came out and I remember seeing the Beatles at the uh, London Palladium where John Lennon said, you in the box, rattle your jewellery. <laughs> and I, you know, and I just love music. Then after that, one of the other memories I was watching The Who play My Generation on Top of the Pops <laughs> and thinking, that's what drumming's about. He's the best looking, he's right up the front, it's all about him. That's what I want to do. And by the time I did play the drums properly, I realised it wasn't... I had to sit at the back and it was... <laughs> You know. What about you, Paul? My parents were beatniks and they listened to people like Juliet Greco, Francois Hardy and some sort of uh, Latin stuff. So it's sort of quite worldly in their outlook. But really, I, I found more of the music that I could relate to was actually outside the front door of where I lived. I lived in Labbert Grove... I was brought up in Brixton and various other places around the country because my father was looking for work. But I found my music really from my classmates who I went to school with because you'd have that thing when you finish school, you hang out at each other's houses and spin records. Well, the first memory is going to somebody's house and we had chicken, rice and peas and we were listening to this music that sort of went tum ti tum ti tum It was sort of scar. And also there was a picture of the Queen on the wall and very sort of almost neon-coloured sort of sofas and cushions. So that was probably the beginning of, of my exploration and experience of music until I became a teenager. And that's when I realised I needed to explore something for myself because most of the people that I went to school were from a West Indian background. And by the time that... Burning Spear came on the scene. They were quite political, obviously, because the civil rights movement in, in America is quite strong, so the nature of the record started changing in terms of black political awareness. So I sort of felt slightly ostracised from this, obviously not being black. But fortunately, around the corner from where I lived in Goulburn Road, Labbert Grove, there was a place called Ted Carroll's, and I used to hang out there with the Teddy Boys, and I'd listen to music by Vince Taylor, Eddie Cochran, and stuff like that. So I got into sort of rockabilly, you know. So that, that was the beginning, really. Oi! 
That was the 1959 classic Brand New Cadillac by Vince Taylor, a track The Clash covered on their London call-in LP. We're currently taking questions from the audience, and this one comes from Mark Davidson. Just want to ask, like, basically, the Bonds era, who was like, the best band that you had support you? We had a lot of different acts supporting us at Bonds. Oh, Lee Perry was and great, if I not like slightly Master eccentric. Flash. I Sorry, say Bob. Curtis Blow. So we all had a different one. I love Grandmaster Flash. At Bonds, I thought he was brilliant. When you went over to America and you were playing with people like Lee Dorsey, you were playing with Screaming Jay Hawkins, you were playing with Bo Diddley, were your minds like blown or was it just like... Well, no, we, we chose these people. It's like I remember the first tour we did of America, our temporary manager at the time, Caroline Kuhn, she said to me and Joe, she said, well, it's your first tour, who would you like? And me and Joe had a few moments, we looked at each other, we said, we'd like Bo Diddley. And she went away and we were thinking, she's not going to get Bo Diddley. No way. And then sure enough, she did. And then it was Mick who said the first tour that Rolling Stones ever did in America was with Bo Diddley. So that's a strange twist. And then we stayed in the same hotel where the Beatles first stayed. And it was where in New York when we went there. And then at the same hotel where Elvis first stayed in New York, the Warwick Hotel. And that's what made it great being on the road as well because... Most bands in those days would have a local pickup band, but I knew when we, when I checked into the hotel, I knew if I got down at the gig, I'd watch Bo Diddley like sound check in and Bo Diddley playing before us, and it, it was amazing. You know, I'd, I'd go to a Bo Diddley gig, and it was he was playing on the bill with us. You know, he, it was, he used to put his guitar on the bunk. Yeah, his we travelled. Did he? Yeah. Slept in the bunk on the bus, and, and he used to he tell us stories. Up. Yeah, he'd, stayed he'd up with his, us. He'd put his his guitar to bed in the bunk. <laughs> And, and then he'd sit up and he'd tell us all stories and he was a real pessimist. He had a big kind of underground air raid shelter for when the you know Armageddon came. And the, there'd be one snowflake and he'd go, oh my God. <laughs> I, remember, I remember we were in there with Jerry Lee Lewis and we got snowed in for a week and I didn't eat for three nights. And it was like all these, you know, doom and gloom stories. It was so entertaining. He used to drink rock and rye. Yeah. Rock and yeah. Rye. yeah. What is that? Well, what the all... good old boys drink? Well, it's got sort of fruit in the bottom of it it's but like it's sort of like a whiskey sort of fruity bourbon thing whiny the fruit liqueur. makes it healthy party on one of your five a day Freeman <laughs> <laughs> mm. J Hawkins of course they carried the coffin on and they opened the lid and then out he popped for the show so these are the tricks of the trade the <laughs> things that we try and do we need a twist here we need a gimmick to get across richard pinley's got a question i think you kind of hit on it there actually but i was going to say it must have been really really exciting being in the early days of the clash what excites you about music these days the possibilities are still there and i'd like to try and find the, the freedom in the music that we had then which is you know like, youth is wasted on youth, you know? Trouble is, you're, like, uh, stupid when you're young. And then when you get older, you know, you know a lot more, but you look terrible. And so, <laughs> how do we... But why do you write great songs when you're young? As Bob Dylan may be an exception, but most people stop writing great songs. You kind of lose it. What happens is you get a mansion, and you get a load of money, <laughs> and you get, a, like, a, a nice girlfriend or something, and then next thing you know... Uh, you're seeing Tom Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Tupper, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I, th I think, like Mick said, when you're young, you've got an attitude that's kind of built in anyway. You know, you're trying to try, even, you know, change your own life and make a success of your own life, whatever you choose to do. And uh, I joined the band because I love playing music and I, I couldn't stand the thought of working in an office or working at any job nine to five and being told what to do and... That was why I wanted to be a musician as well. It wasn't just that I love music, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and get up when I when, wanted to wake up. And, you know, if, if that's a rebellious attitude, that's a rebellious attitude. But I can't understand people who go to work every day I, and, and do the, something that they I, hate I'd, doing. I'd just join a group so I wouldn't have to do a proper job. Personally, the early days of The Clash were more exciting for me because the audience were very close in front of you and also... I didn't mind people chucking bottles and whatever. It sort of made it quite exciting. It's just that when we became successful, suddenly there was a big partition between us and the audience. And it was like you almost felt like you were going through the motions or miming. So I, I sort of felt the early days were much more exciting. But in terms of sort of contemporary bands and youth, you know, it's down to them to write their story. We did ours for our time and expressed what we felt 
of our time so it's down to them to do what they want for their time you know talk about new bands this is the last question from the audience yeah my son age 20 has just um started in a band uh, this summer so if you could give him uh, one piece of i was gonna say good advice but if you could give him one piece of advice what yeah, would it be play bass it's only four <laughs> strings he played <laughs> <laughs> He does play bass. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Listen to the Ramones and reggae music, because then you can hear the bass. And with the Ramones, you get a good engine going on your right hand, you see. <laughs> Topper? Yeah, stick it as your instrument, work really hard at it, and uh, stay away from drugs. <laughs> Mick? Have you got a garage? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> get him in there. <laughs> For the echo. <laughs> For the echo. <laughs> <laughs> or the other place. <laughs> <laughs> the urinals, which brings us right back to the beginning. Please, everybody, thank Mick Jones, Topper Heaton, and Paul Simonon, and Johnny Green for coming with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, the Clash are well known for their love of ska and reggae, but we'll be talking to them later about their love of soul music as well. Um, there were some surprising track suggestions, including Willie Nelson, Procol Harum, and uh, there was a Laverne Baker one as well, a track called Dicks of Billy. But I'm going to play you this one. Ash, and before that you heard Laverne Baker and Jimmy Ricks, and a track called You're the Boss from 1961. You're listening to Six Music, and it's Karis here up until midday, and you're listening to a very special show today. We are doing a live special in front of an audience. Say hello! Hello! And uh, we're in the legendary Maid of Ale studios in the Bing Crosby. I call it the Bing Crosby studio in Studio 3. We are going through some of the song selections from the band. We haven't heard from Topper yet. I don't know if you've uh, picked up on that. So I thought we'd uh, do a Topper choice next. But in fact, Mick Jones chose a track from this artist as well. And I'd love to ask them about it later, about their experimenting and pushing the boundaries of music. So hopefully the, uh, we can ask that question. Uh, it is Captain Beefheart, and it's a track that shows Topper's love for the blues to Gimme That Harp. That was Captain Beefheart and Gimme That Harp Boy, sounding remarkably like Spoonful by Willie Dixon, a brilliant choice from Topper Heden. I'm Keris Matthews and you're listening to a special show we recorded down at the BBC's Made of Ale Studios with a clash in front of a live studio audience. We'll be talking with the Clash tour manager Johnny Green about his time with the band in the next half hour before I bring in the three remaining members. So stay tuned after the news. Epic sounds there from the Tornadoes and Telstar. And that is a Mick Jones choice. That track came out in 1962. Welcome to the show, Johnny Green. Thank you. I'd love to ask you about the beginning, the very beginning, because you, you ended up being a tour manager for The Clash and also John Cooper Clark now. But where did it begin? How did you get into that kind of... I was the fan that got lucky, Keris. You know, any of you could have been where... To rock the very casbah with the truth. Come stand and fight together, not alone. Go start yourself a riot of your own. Set the scene, if you can. You said you grew up in the late 70s. Just to show how fresh that sort of questioning of the politics and the finding of a voice was. They're showing the old Top of the Pops on television from 76, 78, 79. There's novelty songs and it's prog rock. And the bands were... You know, it's either straight from Pontins or they're in the 40s and 50s. And so these bands were just a few years older than us. They came from our background, they talked to us, and it was just an electric shop, a junk lead to the spine, you know. And, and to hear political music, I'm sure a lot of people in this room, part of our political awakening was the clash and the bands that followed them, like the specials, like the jam, like Stiff Little Fingers. It just electrified the scene and, and, and changed a lot of people's lives. Tony, thank you very much. Big round of applause for Longfellow. <laughs> The Sound of Cinema on BBC Radio 6 Music. From 1967, the guns of Navarone and the Scartelites. I uh, enjoyed that in the studio, didn't we? We are here live in front of uh, 200 people at the Maid of Ale studios, and I thought I'd uh, come and say hello again to somebody else. How are you? Hello, how are you? Where have you come from today? Uh, I come from Kent. And uh, how long have you been a Clash fan? Uh, since time immemorial. So a long time since they were around, you know? And uh, you went to see them a lot live? I've seen them, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I grew up in the West Country, so they were the band that made me come to London, pick up a set of drumsticks, so they mean a lot, you know, mean a lot. Could you describe what their kind of live set was like? Aggressive, 
um, eclectic, different, sometimes controlled, sometimes not. What do you mean by that? Totally exciting and really there, out there. It was spot on, do you know what I mean? You could ever not love The Clash, you know? What's your name? Graham. Thanks, Graham. That was uh, Mick Jones' choice, if you were wondering. Well, uh, did you guess whose choice that was? Any guesses? It was Paul Simonon's choice in his list, actually. He had quite a lot of rock and roll. He's um, included Huey Piano Smith, Larry Williams, among many, many other tracks as well. Have a listen to this one and then have another guess at whose list this was on. That's Jet Harris and Tony Meehan and a track called Diamonds, and that was a Mick Jones choice. I don't know if you guessed that one. Uh, if you just joined us, it's Kairos here at Six Music, and we're doing a live special on The Clash from Maida Vale Studios. And I found this on YouTube very recently. Uh, he's a performance poet that was performance poet for Glastonbury Festival. Yeah. And you've been on the show before. Oh, Welcome. Okay. You're here, the, the voice of Longfellow, you're known as, also known as Tony Walsh. Tell me... Tony, why did you write a poem about the clash in 2013? I was a, a council house kid in, in Manchester in, in 78, 79, by the time punk, you know, hit the airwaves and hit the council estates. And it was, it was, I'm sure a lot of people in the room today will agree, it was just electrifying for kids like us, the message and the sound, and just so exciting. And, and my book's called Sex and Love and Rock and Roll, and, and I want to write about exciting things. Um, so I've written a Shakespearean sonnet about the clash. <laughs> It asks in these days of Simon Cowell and X Factor where the next rebel band's coming from. It's called The Last Gang in Town? Question mark. Who these days are the rebels worth the name? Who hates the army, hates the RAF? Who these days takes a gutter sniper's aim? Who fights the law with every beaten breath? Who these days has the baselines or the balls? Who sussed and struts where white man fears to tread? Who these days answers back when London calls? Who catches fire and burns like Natty Dread? Who'll wave a flag above the ship parade? Who'll educate and agitate the youth? Who'll use guitars as weapons unafraid? I am, you know, what, was I technically equipped to do the job? Magnificently, no. I had no electrics. But I'm fond of a roll of gaffer tape, it has to be said. <laughs> was I a professional driver? No. Never done any of that in my life. I think what happened, no, nobody ever bothered to tell me typically with The Clash. I obviously fitted the bill, had the right attitude, liked the same music that they did, and was willing. Was it important to them that the people they hung out with had great music taste? Like, mm. they listened to music all the time, they got cassettes going, they had a yeah. beatbox going. When those uh, beatboxes came in, yeah, it was a cacophony of different noises coming out of each person's one. And driving in the car, you know, was just a car. Sometimes it was just one of those little tiny Renaults, and they would fight that lot, who you'll meet, would fight to see who could control the music in the car, like kids, exactly like kids. Who would win? Whoever usually. was on form that day. And, of course, it does help, doesn't it, if you're in the passenger seat? <laughs> so let's, let's say Mick, shall we? <laughs> but Paul is a very persuasive man. Very persuasive. I'm very curious as, as a member of a band myself and, and knowing how touring works that I, I've heard that with The Clash, you know, it's all about equality, there's an open door policy. You're on tour, so everybody's allowed to come backstage in the dressing room, everyone's allowed on the tour buses. That must have been absolute chaos. Yes, yeah, fabulous. I loved it. <laughs> That was one of the things that really attracted me to The Clash, you know, that they thrived on chaos and trouble, you know. You might even say at times they encouraged it, but certainly one of the first things that I was asked to do was always make sure that backstage door was kept open for people who couldn't afford to get into the gig, you know. The waifs and strays, the gutter snipes, you know. And I was very pleased to do that. I didn't see those people as getting under my feet at all. I thought that was delightful. And equally, there were many, many nights where the crew have packed up, loaded a truck, gone back to the hotel, taken down huge light-in rigs, you know, and the band is still sitting in the dress. Well, it's the 6th of October. Welcome to the show. It's Keris here up until 12 o'clock. It's a very special show today, though. We are recording live from Maida Vale in the legendary studio. We've got the Bing Crosby plaque right behind an audience of 200. Say hello, everybody. <laughs> Are we all excited or what today? It's a very, very special day. There's an amazing box set coming out of Clash Classics and remastered hits 
selection from Mick Jones has remastered and we'll be talking to Mick about it later on. What else have I got in store for you? Johnny Green, their tour manager, is coming along so we can ask him lots of questions as well. The audience, you're going to be asking questions as well, aren't you, to The Clash and um, also we've got a performance poet as well called Longfellow to join us today. When I was invited to do this Clash special, the first thing I always ask any musician that comes to the studio is to give me a list of tracks. I think it takes you in surprising places and indeed some of the track choices were very surprising but this one is not so surprising and I wonder if you can guess whose choice this was. It's a classic. from 1956. The girl can't help it. We are here live in front of 200 people at the Maida Vale Studios and I thought I'd uh, come and say hello. Hello, are you, how are you today? All right, yeah. Where have you come from today? I'm um, Sunderland. And what is it about The Clash that you love? Just everything. I really just enjoy all the music. Like how they went from like punk roots to fried fruit to doing everything, you know, like all different styles. Because the styles changed radically, didn't it, over the years? Do you have any favourite sort of periods? Probably about 78, 79. I'll go next door to you. What's your name, sir? Sam. And where have you come from today? Peterborough. And why are you such a big fan of The Clash? Well, because of my parents really and everything, just growing up listening to The Clash and stuff, yeah. Why are they set apart? I don't know, really like their style and everything, and just the songs is brilliant, yeah. Do you have any favourite periods for them? Uh, well, I have a favourite song, Guns of Brixton. You might be playing that later, I think. 